um, I started working at Ohio State in 2016, October. So I guess come to think of it, it's almost been five years since I've been here. I went to vet school in India, um, graduated in 2007. I, I started my training and my attempt to get clinically trained in equine surgery. Um, as a graduate student, I started a Master of Science program with an equine surgeon in Illinois, and then was fortunate to have rolled into a master's rotating equine internship for from 2007 to 2010, and then applied for my surgery residency the first go around, didn't um, get one then, and then did a surgery internship at Tufts the following year and then um, came back for a surgery residency and a combined PhD program between 2011 and 2016 at University of Illinois. And I may have applied to several jobs after and um, thankfully OSU um, offered me a job, I'm here and a couple of you know things you know certainly i split my appointment between managing research mentoring graduate students veterinary and undergraduate students um 40 of my time i do the remainder of my time in the clinical service um primarily equine orthopedic surgery, uh, lameness in equine orthopedics, and um, some time dedicated towards um, classroom teaching for first and second years. So that's just a brief snapshot. What do I do during my daytime clinics? A lot of it is split between evaluating horses that are presented for lameness exam, unlike Unlike us, you know, horses, it would be way easier and probably um, um, a lot more um, less challenging to work up equine lamenesses if they were able to point their fingers or tell us where their pain and discomfort were um, coming from, um, which is not the case, but I will say this is probably the most challenging aspect of what what I do during um, clinical time is, you know, getting as best of a history as we can, and then, you know, work through a horse that is presented for lameness, whether it may be forelimb, hind limb. A lot of the times, if you're working in a referral institution, you're gonna have maybe more than one leg that might be lame, and certainly horses that uh, has been seen by um veterinarians before and certainly it doesn't have something straightforward so we end up um seeing here we from a surgical standpoint you know this is an example for arthroscopy which is basically visualizing the joint with the help of a camera that we place in the joint as you can see all the white smooth surface is articular cartilage. Now, if I kind of go back here a little bit, see how that discolored area is? There may be a little bit of lag, you guys, on Zoom. Um, there aren't too many videos, but um, this is a very common example of one of the main bread and butter surgeries that we typically do, where we look at the inside of the joint um, identify abnormalities. There may be bone chips, there may be cartilage abnormalities that we go in and debride and, you know, hopefully prevent long-term joint damage and joint injury. So this is not the, you know, the only thing that we, um, we can, um, sorry, one second. 
this is not like the only only type of things that we do, but a good majority of what we do is, you know, arthroscopic surgery, lameness evaluation. Now, you know, we have equine soft tissue surgery where, you know, we evaluate horses with upper respiratory problems. So we don't typically have these subspecialties within um, equine surgery, but more so from an expertise standpoint, what we evolved doing since our training will, will help us um, decide um, how we go from there. Okay, so before we kind of get into some of the research aspects, as I said, you know, a lot, m pretty much all of right now, my current research is based on tendon healing. This is what my PhD research was in as well. The um, research that I did as a PhD student was, you know, typically, and we'll go over some of this, you know, we use um, stem cells for uh, tendon healing in horses and in people in other species as well. Now, will using stem cells isolated from tendon, will they have better improved capacity? Now, why do we need to help tendon with um, stem cells or any of the other stuff. Now, if we compare and contrast, this is cartilage histological structure on the left here, and I have bone histological structure. So if we kind of think of the main musculoskeletal tissues, bone has an outstanding healing capacity probably one of the few musculoskeletal or few tissues in the body that can regenerate fully. And cartilage does not have a good healing capacity like tendon. And if we kind of think of that, you know, there are several reasons and aspects to that. The um, tendon, as you can see, all the pink stuff is collagen. These purple faint lines that we see, those are cells inside of tendon that we call tendon cells or tenocytes. Tenocytes are very few in tendon. Basically, we call them, you know, acellular, but they do have some cells. They are relatively sparse in their cellularity. They have minimal vascularity. So their healing capacity as a consequence is, is pretty poor. So anything we can do to help it is, is going to be beneficial. Now, we will discuss a little bit more later, but tendon also heals with fibrosis or fibrotic tissue. As you know, I, I do have equine examples here as a major musculoskeletal debilitating condition. Certainly, they're not fatal in nature, but chronic pain will decrease the quality of life impact the athletic outcome that these horses are um, supposed to have, all of those things. So we need to, you know, not only are they frustrating when they occur, even though you give them six to seven months time to heal, their healing capacity is poor. So when they go back to work, up to 60% of the time, they can have re-injury whether it may be a race horse, whether it may be a competition horse, similar in dogs, similar in um, people as well, athletes that have Achilles tendon injury. So the theme is, is pretty common. And then the other point I'm trying to impress upon here is, you know, certainly um, horses have they have to bear weight on their legs as they are healing throughout. So that makes it a bit more um, challenging to, to deal with. But the other thing to think about is, you know, what we learn from horses and what we learn from people, they are translatable, right? So not only do we approach tendon injuries in horses, or at least from a research standpoint, is it relevant what we learn just to horses or can this be you know, extrapolated to people, 
right? In the form of experimental data that we've obtained from horses, all of that stuff. So in human athletes, like I said, it's the same, same type of injuries that you deal with. They may not have the same tendons, but the occurrence and the healing potential, they are all similar. When we look at, let's say, for example, this is a horse's distal limb, right? Each of these bundles that we see, they all encompass tendons. Now there are some at the front of the leg here. There are some at the palmar aspect of the limb here. So if we see these are what we have in the front of the limb, what we can call them as positional tendon. They don't have a major weight bearing capacity, but they keep bones and muscles and maintain joint locomotion in a physiologic manner. Whereas you have tendons that come at the back where such as the superficial digital flexor tendon, suspensory ligament, deep digital flexor tendon, these are weight bearing structure. So certainly that really has an impact on, you know, the function of the limb, injury to weight bearing tendons, right? We said that horses have to bear weight on their legs as the healing is taking place. They have a poor healing capacity. So injury in energy storing tendons, which have a lot of load bearing function on them, their injury outcomes may not be as great as positional tendons. Positional tendons have a much better healing capacity. They don't bear a lot of weight. So even though we make these classification from from a location standpoint, their functional outcome is quite distinct. When we think about, okay, what is the fuss about tendon? You know, why does it heal poorly? What is so specialized about it? From a longitudinal standpoint, and these are this is a histological image, right? So if we take six micron sections of tendon, put it under a polarization microscope, you can see these collagen fibers that are oriented along the long axis of tendon. And you can also see that it has a wave-like pattern to it. Now, when I look at the cross section, meaning to say if I slice a cross tendon and look at it, right? So this is what you can see even with your gross visualization or just staring at it, you can see that there are several bundle-like structures that have come together. So if we put this together, right, you have this whole tendon, which consists of several different what we call fascicles. Now, what are fascicles? Fascicles are collections of collagen fibers, which is made up of individual collagen fibrils. So if we can kind of look at this, right, this is a multi-scale hierarchical structural arrangement, meaning to say collagen fibrils come together to form the collagen fiber. Many such fibers come together to form the tendon fascicle. Many such fascicles come together to form what we call and recognize as the whole tendon. Now, between fascicles, we have tissue that is called the endotendon, also known as the interfascicular matrix. This is sort of the matrix like tissue that is present between fascicles. You have this connective tissue that is around the tendon that we call paratenin. So all of these structures are critical for the tendon mechanical function. And we'll get to that in a second. Now, is there a difference in what are the biochemical composition of these the fascicle and the, and the interfascicular matrix. We told that fascicle is basically a collection of collagen fibers. Now in this histological image here, this is a SHG or a second harmonic generation imaging microscopy. So basically this microscopy is great to look at collagen fiber architecture so all the wave-like crimp pattern that we were seeing, those are the collagen fibers, which is, 
<coughs> present, which is densely present in the fascicle and makes up about 90% of tendon dry mass. So you have collagen type one, which is the major constituent of tendon. You have some minor quantities of collagen type three, comp, decorin. However, when we look at this interfascicular matrix, which is that connective tissue present between fascicles, right? There is a lot of void here, right? Unlike this green collagenous structure, you have this black and the black is there because there is no collagen to provide that signal, but you have a lot of cells there. You have some of this red stuff all the blue stuff are the nuclei of the cells, so which you have both in the fascicle and the interfascicular matrix. And you have what we call elastin in the interfascicular matrix. Now, as the name suggests, elastin provides elasticity to tendon. You have also some quantities of what we call lubricin, which provides lubrication to the fascicles. Now, why do we need this, right? So if we kind of look at this here, the interfascicular matrix allows these individual fascicles to slide between each other. Now, why do we need this hierarchical arrangement and how does this help mechanical, mechanically for tendon to be able to do its function? Now, when there is weight bearing, no matter what species, right, the tendon undergoes elongation and then recoils, elongation and then recoils. Now, how does that happen? It happens in each of these hierarchical structure. The wave-like pattern that we see in the collagen fibers, they get straightened out. The fascicles slide among themselves, right? A lot of the mechanical elasticity or the tensile strength in tendon comes from the fascicles sliding between each other. Some of it comes from the collagen fiber crimp pattern flattening amongst themselves as well. And there's a good example for this, right? So here you can see that in the lab, we're ripping apart a piece of tendon. And as you can see, we'll look at it again. Watch these dots, that how they separate from each other. You see how that it kind of shears rather than just go snap in the center. This is indicative of that sliding motion or that interfascicle sliding that we talk about. So, you know, all of this function is critical for tendons to be able to do their job. Now, how is this clinically re relevant, right? Okay, the horse has injury. We it tears its tendon, whether as a complete rupture or at these minor levels. When it heals, it is not restored back to this hierarchical structure, which is what we refer to as the, um, which is what we refer to as, I'm sorry, give me a second. Um, what we refer to as fibrosis, right? The goal for tendon healing is to be able to establish this multi-scale hierarchical structure that we talk about, easier said than done, but that should be the goal, ultimate goal of tendon healing. Now, why do we need this hierarchical structure? Is to allow the maximum tensile strength that the tendon is able to do. So kind of the same thing here in the stress strain curve. So when you rip tendons apart in a lab setting, you can see what happens when, when these collagen fibers flatten out and tear out, you know, you can, you can see how the curve changes. Now, a couple of groups, including ours, have tried to work out is this simply a proximal distal extension in the collagen fibers? And as you can see here, you know, what this group showed is not only do they go proximal to distal, there's a little bit of rotation movement there 
as well. So basically what we've come to understand for tendon structure and function is they have a spring-like function to be able to bear load and be able to allow um, extension and recoiling function. Now, this is an example for some of the work that we've conducted in our lab, right? We talked about, okay, what are the things we look for in an SHG image for um, cross-section here and longitudinal? Here you can see the individual fascicles. Now, this is in a normal tendon, kind of how see they are compact, collagen fascicles, the blue stuff is where the interfascicular matrix is, right? Now, these two are from injured tendons. These are experimental injuries. This is six weeks after tendon injury. This is 16 weeks after tendon injury. You can see how this compact, dense arrangement and these smaller fascicles are you know sort of a blob of a scar tissue that is present within there now if you have less number of fascicles if you're going to have less interfascicular matrix right your extensile function or the tensile strength is consequently going to be lower now historically up until a few years ago or even now right are focus is always on, okay, I, when I ultrasound the um, tendon, I am looking for longitudinal fiber patterns, but there is really no way for us to know how the cross-sectional structure is or how the cross-sectional healing is occurring. So paying attention to both is, is critical. Now, some of our work has um sorry there's a case in the hospital that they are asking me a question about um anyways so you can see that in the interfascicular matrix the number of cells during healing also increases. Now we're looking, trying to figure out, okay, what is the character of these cells? What's the nature of these cells? You know, now, even though there is a fair amount of inflammation there, is that where the inflammatory cells are present? How do they communicate and talk to cells within the fascicle itself, right? That's all an area of ongoing work. Now, you know, these kind of graphically shows what we um, look for beforehand. As you can see here, you know, we were able to appreciate this in the picture. The fascicle size increases by almost twofold, even 16 weeks after injury, right? The interfascicular matrix gets more than twice as big or thick in six weeks, comes back down towards normal in four months, but not close to there, still about, 50% larger. We mentioned elastin as something that provides elasticity to the interfascicular matrix, right? This elastin, that is, see, you can kind of see this red stuff here, right? Which is rich in the interfascicular matrix. And if you superimpose these two images, you can see how the elastin is restricted or largely localized to the interfascicular matrix. Now, during injury, even the elastin com co component goes down drastically. So far, we've only followed these lesions up to 16 weeks after injury, right? I don't have information on and we don't know much about, okay, what could be the timeframes in which we're expecting elastin to be restored? And, you know, something, something that I think beyond our group here will um, look at it and evaluate quantitatively assessing the same thing. Now, if you see, you know, in the elastin levels do not come down um, or they're still about threefold less than what you are seeing in um, normal tendon. So two things we can take away from here, right? The fascicle size 
is markedly increased and the interfascicular elastin content is drastically decreased together you know not only should you know are we focused on the collagen structure which is in the longitudinal plane there are several other constituents that we are evaluating in tendon now you know we talked a little bit about um tendon structure and tendon biochemical um, constituents. Where does this come from or what or how does this get there, right? There, you know, even without injury, there is going to be some normal wear and tear. Some of it is going to um, ask, you know, we're going to replenish even as normal homeostasis, homeostasis restores over time, right? Now, this is just a larger view of what we already saw. So this is your crimp pattern, the wave-like you know, nature. And you have all these nuclei that are interspersed among the collagen fibers. It is these tenocytes that produce all the extracellular matrix components. So when we refer to extracellular matrix, this is all the tissue or the matrix that is present outside the cell and is secreted by the cell. Now, tenocytes synthesizes the collagen molecules, right? So the, the collagen fibril that we talked about, that is assembled outside of the cell. The collagen precursor, what we know as tropocollagen, I'm sure there are um, several biochemistry enthusiasts here that you know will understand this much better than I do, where the tropocollagen will become a triple helix and then secreted out of the cell and all of the assembly and the hierarchical arrangement occurs extracellularly. Now, this is a major loaded statement here, right? This is what we believe. I don't think we know how and when, and what are the mechanical influences that impact this process. The load-bearing capacity for tendon is necessary for this collagen assembly to occur, and how and what are the signals what are the biological and the cellular signals that are important for this collagen secretion, collagen assembly, and the structural organization to occur, right? This is probably several years worth of research that I've tried to put here on one slide, perhaps beyond one lifetime of a scientist or a research group that is um, focusing on this. So these are, you know, something something important and things to think about, right? Um, collagen assembly. There are, you know, we talked about this. The three the three tropocollagen form a triple helix, and the tropocollagen is also called as the microfibril, and many such collagen fibrils come together to form the collagen fiber, which we associate as the fundamental unit of tendon. After having gone through a fair amount of info, do you guys have any questions? There's a little bit of a start, stopping, um, stopping point here. I'm happy to answer any questions if you guys may have, and then we can um, move forward. That kind of brings us to um, that. That kind of brings us to the next um, question here. You know, we know and we talked about how this 
extracellular matrix is distributed within the tendon, right? Now, where they are present, how they are present, they're all very dynamic in nature. It changes with development, changes with, you know, becoming skeletally mature, how exercising happens, and also from an aging standpoint. There's, so that's a very active area of ongoing research where, you know, how increasing age impacts these musculoskeletal tissue structures, you know, similar to when we think of bone and osteoporosis in people, right? Joint disease is more common in older people. Tendon should really not be any, any different, right? So all of that, how these, right? No, now the thing that we, we kind of worked out is all of the cells are the ones that are producing this extracellular matrix um, component. So how do these affect, you know, the rate at which these cells are producing is something that we are really interested in. Now, okay, we kind of understand the fuss about tendon structure, and then we kind of understood or at least tried to think of, okay, so what if, the, if they have a complicated structure? It's truly the cells that maintain the structure and you know, maintain the um, architecture of the tissue. Do the cells change during injury and healing? And the answer is yes. So now if we look at a very acutely injured tendon, which is five weeks after experimental injury, you can see that how these spindle shaped spindle shaped cells they kind of look more chunky they look more rounded in nature right so certainly they look different now if they are looking different does it mean that their in c2 activities are different are they still producing the same extracellular matrix constituents, which is, you know, collagen, um, some other compounds that we talked about, or do they produce different types of tissues, which alters the um, tendon structure? So far, everything we've discussed is in, as we know, in extracynovial tendon. Now, what do I mean by that? These are tendons that are present outside of a synovial cavity. Now, tendons that traverse bony surfaces, now that may be um, biceps tendon in people. It may be uh, the gastroc tendon, some portion of the Achilles tendon. Horses have several such areas. In dogs, you have the calcaneal tendon. Um, you have the deep digital flexor tendon in uh, horses. So they are lined by a synovial cavity, which we refer to as intrasynovial tendon, meaning to say they are present inside a synovial cavity. Now, all tendons are not equal, right? We talked about positional and energy storing tendon. Intrasynovial tendon could be positional and energy storing as well, but they have a different structural adaptation because they are lying up against a bony surface, so they have more friction to them. Now, how do uh, how are they structurally adapted to to um, accommodate this function? As you can see here, this is more towards our normal tendon, but if you look at this area here, which is up against the bone. Now this tendon, what we call deep digital flexor tendon is this area that is up against the navicular bone inside the hoof capsule of a horse. So as you can see here, this tendon undergoes a lot of friction by moving across or gliding across this tendon. This is similar to the forefingers in us where these tendons kind of have a smooth fibrocartilaginous surface that allows them to glide up against bony surfaces. Now in horses, this is a major problem for forelimb lameness, where you can see here 
that you can see this split thickness injuries that you you have here and you have this arrow that's pointing out here right now how these heal are quite different from how extrasynovial tendon that we just talked about. Now in this surgical video here, this is, you know, looking through a camera, you can see this wand like structure is going in and smoothing down all that torn fibers that is present within the intrasynovial space, right? So you can, you can see that the point of this procedure is we're trying to smooth down all the te torn tendon fibers that are protruding into the synovial space, causing irritation, pain, and lameness. So we're helping this healing by going in and debriding that area. Now, the reason to think about these guys a little bit, these guys, meaning intrasynovial from extrasynovial tendon, the reason to do that, I'm looking to the right because my, you guys are on my right, but I know my camera is um, looking towards the front. So pardon me, I'm not um, getting distracted every 10 seconds here. So we need to approach these injuries a little bit differently from our extrasynovial tendon injuries because these are present within a synovial cavity. So there's minimal blood supply and their healing potential, believe it or not, is actually way worse than if we thought that was bad. It, this is even, even more so bad. A little bit of difference here, you know, certainly compared to what we have learned so far, there is that fibrocartilage surface here in the in the dorsal aspect or the side that is against the bony surface right now fibrocartilage what we mean by that there is more proteoglycan or glycosaminoglycans that provides that hydrostatic pressure to withstand that gliding function and the resistance that it may encounter from against um, the opposing bony surface. Now, even though they are separate, there are some commonalities in their injury and healing. Um, we think of tendon injury as, you know, something that may be occurring in an acute nature, or this may take a period of time, or it may be a culmination of several smaller traumas that progress to a point where it becomes a clinically uh, apparent injury, right? And that's kind of why, where, and why, and how we have all these arrows shooting off from all the different places. What we would see here is none of these arrows have a bidirectional path in there, meaning to say once a normal tendon has become degenerate or healed tendon, quote unquote healed, it is never similar to what it was prior to the tissue becoming injured. Now that's where the mechanical compromise comes from and where the mechanical disconnect between the tendon and the um, functional properties. So we said that the interfascicular matrix and the fascicle sliding provides a majority of the tensile strength, right? So we need to assess both the collagen fiber structure as well as the higher order structure and, you know, we need to develop measures to correlate how we can line up both the cross-sectional architecture as well as the longitudinal architecture. And we mentioned briefly about how age can change tendon structure. This is one of the studies from a group across the Repand in the UK, where they so showed that this is kind of what the structure looks like in a five-year-old horse. Now in a 20-year-old horse, you can see that this is the area where the interfascicular matrix is, right? It looks pretty 
robust here. Whereas when you look at a 20 year old, right, you can kind of tell where it is, but it's nearly not as distinct as that. So could that affect the tensile ability of the tendon? You know, I would say so, right? We attributed a lot of the tendon mechanical strength to these fascicles being able to slide up against, um, slide up against um, each other. So this group, they have actually, you know, broken down, um, you know, between, between each other and then, you know, tested the individual interfascicular matrix, right? Now, after having said all of this, how can we, right? We've learned a lot about tendon structure, what kind of structure it needs to have for this superior mechanical strength. Where does all the matrix components come from? And how can we improve the quality of repair, right? How can we reduce the scar formation? That is, we want more a regenerative healing instead of a fibrotic healing capacity. And that's important because that means that the tendon can function properly and will not have or have a decreased chance of having a second injury once it goes back to work. So far, how have we learned how to achieve this or work towards this? Certainly providing rest and rehabilitation after injury to give it time. And tendons do stuff when they have some loading, maybe not the equine extreme example where they have to bear load at all times. Um, you know, but I think, I think in people, we have the ability to say, okay, you need to wear a crutch or you need to wear a boot um, to be able to um, allow the tendon to heal. Not a luxury we have with our veterinary patients. Certainly we can do medical augmentation, meaning to say there are medical therapies such as we'll go through a few of them. We talked about a surgical procedure that will help um, reduce some of that torn fibers. We talked about there are tendon suturing techniques that we can use. They may have limited value in horses where, you know, the size of the animal is so large, but in, in people, it's pretty common and standard, even in dogs, to be able to suture, suture the tendons back together if they have severed into two ends, you know, certainly um, giving horses non-steroidal anti-inflammatories such as phenylbutazone, flunixin, you know, we've learned to recognize that early inflammation is required for improved healing. How long do we need to do this for? And do they impact the activity of the tendon cells? You know, these are all ongoing work that I think will become highly beneficial to know the answers for, to do the best treatment plan that there is that we can do. In addition, you know, certainly controlling the inflammation or modulating the inflammation, right? We can control the population of the immune cells that, that you may have and, um, you know, certainly there are good immune cells that promote an, an improved immune response that will allow a regenerative healing response versus um, fibrosis. There have been a few reports where they have identified that using non or NSAIDs will support a more M2 phenotype, which is a good macrophage to reduce inflammation and fibrosis. In addition to that, are there other aspects that we can provide within the tendon healing environment to improve healing? You can um, use biologic therapies. You know, we call them regenerative therapies. I'm a little cautious about using the word regenerate because you know, I think our ability to make it go back to how it was is pretty, pretty small or pretty minimal. 
but biologic therapies actually kind of relates to how we can or what the nature of these products are. In this category, you have platelet-rich plasma, you have bone marrow stem cells, uh, and several other mesenchymal stem cell-based therapies. You can use bone marrow concentrate, several others. I don't want this to kind of morph into an infomercial or um, try to highlight one over the other, but provide a broad overview of what are some of the options. All of these are geared towards enhancing the activity of the cells present in tendon, which produce the matrix components to improve the cellular healing characteristics. The promising result that we have seen with cell-based therapy is their histological structure improves, their ultrasound appearance improves. And I think this, this paper provides an emphatic support that the number of re-injuries that these racehorses sustained after stem cell therapy was significantly lower than horses that did not receive stem cell therapy. So, you know, maybe there's value in this. You know, I think, I think our understanding is quite primitive yet, even though it's been 12 years since this paper has come out. You know, there is a benefit in these um, stem cell therapies. They may not make it faster. They may not make it superior. Potentially, we can improve the quality of the healing such that their chances of re-injury may be lower. Now, you know, again, I don't want to make it seem like stem cells will fix everything. This is the ev level of evidence that we have so far. So if we compare how many of those with re-injury, you can see that with conventional treatment, a lot of these horses had conventional treatment without stem cells, which is just rest and rehab, you know, 56% versus 18%. That's kind of the, you know, the difference that we're, we're talking about. Anyways, you know, I think something to note, um, and keep in mind that still requires further work here. Again, kind of paraphrasing what we have mentioned, what is the rationale, right? We know that the stem progenitor cells are present in all mesenchymally derived tissue. Why are they present? They are present because they replenish or they divide to populate the tissue. Now, stem cells in each tissue, they depend on what tissue they are present. So could using stem progenitor cells from tendon, could they be a better source for improving tendon healing? This was one of the first studies that identified tendon stem cells within, um, within tendon where you um, they showed that they are a unique niche by themselves. They are similar to bone marrow MSCs, but they're not the same. And we've done some work. This was part of my master's work where we seeded these tendon derived stem cells on tendon matrix and compared it to bone marrow. You can see how tendon derived stem cells are really loving to stick on these tendon pieces compared to bone marrow, right? After having seen these results, we then decided to inject these tendon derived cells into tendon. As you can see here, we followed these horses for 12 weeks after injection. We collected their tissue. And here's what we saw, interestingly. We looked that at one week, all the red stuff is the cells we've injected into the tissue. The blue stuff are all the cells that are present. One week after injection, two week, four week, and six week. By the time we get to the six week point, there are no cells that we injected. They are gone. Uh, did they migrate away? Did they die? Um, I don't know the answer to that question. My suspicion would be that 
they don't survive for very long within the tissue. Now that is not something unique to tendon. We didn't discover anything earth shattering here. This is a common phenomenon that is noted with other types of stem cells injected into tendon, injected into joints. They don't persist for much longer beyond two to three weeks after we, we inject. But even without that, they do improve the healing in the tissue. And this is the question that becomes really, really um, interesting. Without being there, what are some of the mechanisms that these cells might make the healing better? Can we identify these mechanisms? If we do identify, then you know we can potentially move away from decellularizing, meaning to say we don't necessarily need to inject cells. We can promote the factors from these cells that um, improve healing. You know, can we alter the local cytokines, trophic factors, and how have we brought this to the clinic? Right, we do bone marrow mesenchymal stem cells. Really, routinely, I uh, actually did two cases today where we had harvested stem cells. We cultured them in the lab, as you can see here, right? We get anywhere from 10 to 20 million cells, and we are able to target these areas of injury. Now, how much to use, when to use, you know, do we need to repeat these injections? They're all great questions. I don't have a fantastic answer for. But certainly, we can get the stem cells from the same horse, which we term autogenous. We can obtain it from the same species, but a different patient. And there are several studies which have reported, you know, allogeneic cells, they don't cause a reaction. They can um, be used in a safe and an effective manner. And I think that a more work on this will help us decide, you know, it, it will speed up the process, right? We don't have to collect bone marrow from the horse, grow it out for three to four weeks. It may be more uh, point of care by being able to use allogeneic um, therapies. I believe this is my last slide. I do want to, you know, say a couple of things here. I think as veterinarians, we have the luxury of being able to try these uh, innovative therapies without undergoing extensive FDA approvals that we need for people. However, we need to be judicious about that, right? Now, in people, having undergone extensive lab culture for cells is not something that is allowed to go back to the patient without FDA approval, right? Which I think for our veterinary patients, the st standards are a little bit lower, right? And we treat cells as drugs, which we need to prove as safe and effective, right? And I don't think we should treat these biologic therapies any differently, and, but still be able to potentially have the place and the time to use it in um, horses that may give us data to promote that in, in people, right? So there are ups and downs to it. And, you know, I think um, we certainly, there is a lot left for us to learn in this regard. But anyways, maybe this seemed like a scatterbrain approach to things, but hopefully we've, I've impressed upon you guys some factoids about tendon structure, function, healing, and try to integrate some of my research in there as well and the goal for the, for the lab. With that, um, I will stop the screen share and I'm happy to answer any questions that you may, you may have. I see what um, 
What would you say is the normal healing process for tendons outside of research? What is the time frame? That's a great question, right? So tendon, and it's a good way to remember, bone has four letters, tendon has six, ligament has seven. If you give a month to every letter, that's kind of how long it takes. So at the very minimum, six to eight months, I would say that is not long enough. Now, even at the end of the year, there is still some remodeling that's undergoing within the, within the tissue, but roughly I would say six to eight months at the minimum. The risk of re-injury, you know, I wish I had a good answer for that. That can be sporadic and variable. It truly depends on what the initial injury um, was and how severe it was. Now, I would say something that is not very severe, um, you may not have the chance for re-injury, but that may be thinking of it from a very simplistic, simplistic standpoint. You know, I would say when the horse or the patient goes back to maximal activity, that may be in eight months time, in 10 months time, that's kind of where we start to think of when the re-injury can occur. I have seen re-injuries up to three to four years after, but this is kind of where, you know, carefully watching the horse or the patient, monitoring for change in the comfort level. Now, good riders, good trainers will keep, pick up slight changes. It may be swelling, heat, slight discomfort, and, you know, being preemptive on it, you know, do we need to ultrasound it, check it? And if there is concern, back off from the, or the back down from the level of work that the uh, patient is doing. You know, I think, I think those, I cannot overemphasize that. And it would be the same when we are reintroducing exercise, right? Very low and slow over a period of weeks and months. And, you know, I had another question, can physical therapy help? Absolutely, right? Sports medicine rehabilitation is a specialty college by itself in veterinary medicine as well, right? Like in people. And now there are a lot of physical therapy options for um, horses as well. You know, we have underwater treadmill, which improves muscle strength, but doesn't load the joints as much, right? We have anything simple from having the horses. It depends on what the injury is too. We do belly lifts, core lifts. You know, we take a carrot from the head towards all the way towards the side of their flank or between their legs and have them do passive range of motion right? All of those things. From a tendon specific standpoint, you can, you know, basically when we're talking about reintroduction, we're doing five minutes every two days for a few months, right? These are long lists of rehab protocol that you reintroduce work. So you're gradually loading these tendons and ligaments over a period of three to four months, which is all part of um, physical therapy. It is a little challenging when a 1200 pound animal has to bear weight on all its four feet, but there is, there is, there are adaptations and the value of it is um, immense. Do you ever deal with injuries that you're unable to properly treat? You know, I think the facetious answer to this would be, I don't know if I can treat any tendon ligament injury in a horse properly. And I say that because, you know, you, there isn't a cure for this. There isn't a fix. Everything we do is helping the body's healing response improve. Now, you know, I think, I think there are injuries what such as, you know, simple fractures, or if I have a wound that I'm able to um, suture and repair, you know, I think we are in a position, I don't want to make it sound like we can't do anything in an equine surgery, right? There are lots of stuff that we can do. Um, but I think 
tendon ligament injuries, I'm never satisfied with what we can do. And there are always ways to augment the healing. And I don't think we're there yet where we can uh, fully make it regenerate to how it was. Could a graft from a different tendon help strengthen the area that tore? That's a great question. And the answer in horses is no. And I say no because the utility, so we, in people, this is immense, right? So when they have um, injuries in the forearm, there are banks to get tendon grafts that you can get it and you can suture it. You put them in a cast and not only it can engraft into that tissue, it also becomes a scaffold to improve the quality of the healing. We can, certainly we don't have a bank facility for horse tendons, but there are tendons in the horse's legs that we can use as a donor tendon to use as a graft. I will say in the few times that I have tried it, they die off, they don't live. Um, I think we are we are trying to push water uphill. If that is such a thing, right? That is that frustration when we deal with tendon. You are trying to repair something that is working at the same time. So that becomes a challenge. I will say when we can graft it, it acts as a scaffold to allow a template for the cells. So there may be a temporary benefit to it. It's not very commonly used in, ten, in horses um, before the reasons that we, we talked about. Okay, it looks like we're about at 8.03. So if anyone has any last minute questions, you can ask, I think, if, if you're okay to stay. For sure, for sure. I have a few minutes to spare, no problem. All right, if not, then yeah, thank you for coming. <laughs>